Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running Virtual Roundtable, where we three doctors of physical therapy discuss the art and the science to the stuff that we put on our feet. Today, we are going to be taking a deep dive into the past and current trends in stability. This is, if you've been paying attention to the running world, this is definitely something that has been changing um, over time. And there have been some things that have been consistent, some things that are changing. And we just want to give a little bit of a conversation Matt, uh, in particular, is super passionate about this. Part of his PhD work is looking into some of this stuff. But uh, I told him and DJ before we started that we're going to try to keep this under 20 minutes. So I'll stop prefacing so that we can get as much as we can about it. But Matt, do you want to give us, give us a two-minute summary of uh, maybe we should define stability, uh, define what it means for running shoes, and then give a quick background of kind of the trends and stability over the last five to 10 years? So typically in the running world, stability is, is, is usually defined by the use of a medial post uh, in a way to quote unquote stop or slow down pronation. The way we are going to talk about stability is gonna go far beyond that, which is where the running industry is slowly going. A lot of this history, by the way, comes from what the running boom happened is a lot of different podiatrists and a couple other professions really focused on pronation as a source of running inj injuries. And that's where all these kinds of orthotics and developments in the football world came from. However, what we're going to talk about today is going to shed light on what stability actually means and what we've come to understand it now based on years and years of literature. And it's definitely not what you think it is. And before we go any further, just to, for anyone who hears the word pronation, but doesn't have a full picture of what that means in their head, I'll give a little bit. You guys can obviously add in. Pronation is a multifaceted word. So that involves both the back of the foot and the heel, the middle of the foot, and even, even the forefoot. So um, pronation is, if you just want to visualize a foot having an arch in it, and if that arch were to flatten, um, that would be the most visual that you can quote unquote see pronation pronation happens in the rear foot in combination with the midfoot and the forefoot. So the rear foot is the, what we have is the calcaneus and it rotates externally. And so it kind of rotates out um, where the, the bottom of the foot. <laughs> Thanks, David. For those of you listening on podcast, David showed it, DJ showed us his heel, but the, the bottom of the heel would rotate outwards. Um, and the bone that makes up the top part of the arch, the navicular moves towards the ground and in or towards the other foot. So that's kind of that combined uh, piece of pronation. One of the problems in not just the running industry, but outside of the running industry is the term pronation has been demonized. When people, most people, when they hear it, they think, oh, this is a pathology. There's something wrong with me. I have pronation. Pronation actually describes emotion. It is a normal motion. It is a normal biomechanical motion. Um, we'll start diving into some of the literature and clinical experience. If you do not pronate, you are likely more at risk for injury than if you do. Pronation is part of shock absorption. When you hit the ground, even during walking, your foot needs to pronate. That arch kind of collapsing, that's part of shock absorbing as you hit the ground. It is not abnormal. You do not want, you know, you don't want to stop people, all people from pronating. That would be horrible. Those who have very stiff and rigid feet, typically that do not pronate, typically have a very high risk based on the literature and experience of bone related injuries, stress injuries, things like that. And guess what? Some of the literature we've actually found, pronation is actually protective against injuries in several populations because it's part of shock absorption. So that's the first thing I want you to know is that it's emotion. It's not a bad thing, it's emotion. And I think an easy way to picture that is to imagine yourself jumping off of um, like from five or six feet up in the air and landing with straight knees um, and then jumping off that and landing with allowing your knees to bend. The, if you're going through pronation, you have a bent knee landing, you know, that's the um, analogy, analogy there versus, versus having a rigid arch with no, you know, or sorry, I shouldn't even said that, yeah. <laughs> but not going through any pronation um, would, would be more like a stiff knee landing. So you can right. imagine, you can see how that could be beneficial. Um, I think, I think this is a, a good part to kind of talk about, um, the changing in the literature is actually informing 
footwear development because you, as you said, it's been demonized over time, but we're learning that it actually can be protective against injury. So talk about, so medial post, let's talk about that for a second and then go into what some of the newer trends are. And maybe we'll walk through a bunch of shoes as we do this. So by the, so the concept of, of this whole pronation control thing was the idea. Yeah. David, go for it. David wanted to say something. Yeah. It's all good, man. Um, no, I just wanted to say before we get going that like, yes, uh, pronation has kind of been demonized, but I just want to say that within the literature that it's a relative motion and that there hasn't necessarily been a defined amount of over and or under pronation. That's a very good point is again, like we, when somebody says somebody over pronates, we don't have a a standard definition of what that is, even after what, how many years of people using that term? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so paradigm one was pronation is bad. Let's stop it, which introduce medial post, right? So let's go into that. So a medial post, so medial is the inner side, right? A medial post was designed to be a thick block of material that was supposed to stop your foot from pronating and keep it in midline. The, the previous thinking was, and so different people do that differently. So David, can you grab the, the Mizuno again? So typically yeah. most companies had that what's called second density foam and they put it on the medial side and, they, and it was supposed to stop pronation. Mizuno does things a little differently. We'll talk about some other companies that do stuff differently. It didn't have to always be the medial post, but it was in some way stiffening up the medial side of the shoe, the inner part, to kind of get you to either go on the outside or more on that inside. Because the thought was, oh, if you deviate outside of the middle, there, there's going to be problems, which we have discovered that's not necessarily true. So this is a good example. So this is one of the older versions of the Forza. Um, you can see they're nice enough to actually make the material a different color. Not all companies do that. So David, can you grab the 860 again? Yeah. So the 860 is, it's still a newer shoe. There we go. There's a couple of them. You can see that le- material. It's a little bit darker. The density is a little bit higher. So the, go- the idea is again, when you land and pronate into that, it's supposed to resist some of that motion and keep you going forwards. Whether or not that that works is up for debate. Whether or not it, it helps or hinders people, we'll, we'll talk about that. It doesn't necessarily hurt depending on the person, but that's how things are traditionally done was a medial post. And that's what every stability had for a long, stability shoe had for a long time. And now things are a little bit different. Things are They're all over change. the board. Yes. You have, so like, I feel like, I feel like you my, have. This is one of my favorite ones. So. We'll have this review of the Structure 23 and the Keanu Light, but me, these are both supposedly stability shoes, but have no post whatsoever. And the Keanu Light is still supposed to be a high level stability shoe. There's no post. It's just all geometry and it's using some uh, many different components that we'll talk about, but you can do this outside of using a post. So I think, I think in the last year we've, we've tried a bunch of different shoes with different types of stability. We just talked about New Balance 860 and the New Balance Prism. Those have yep. traditional posts that are, well, s- s- pseudo traditional posts. Uh, we then, might have to Prism, but. Yeah, we'll go almost. there later. Yeah. Um, we have things like the Arahi. We've, we haven't tested the five, but the Arahi 4 from Hoka and the Forza have a full length right. um, dual density. And then the Arahi actually wraps around the heel. Um, you have the uh, Brooks has made a change. So you have the Adrenaline series that now has guide rails and so does the Ravenna. So you have guide rails, no longer a post, but you have guide rails, um, which are just pieces of plastic long, just above the, the midsole. You have, what else, what else is there that's I, different? I would like to give a shout out to Mizuno with their high cushioning, high stability model, the Wave Horizon 4. Um, they did a dual density midsole there and it's a full length and it wraps around somewhat similar to a guide rail, but doesn't feel like that at all. So that's another way that they've used innovation on their end to kind of, they're trying to use more like geometry to kind of, again, right. guide the foot. And one of the big paradigm shifts, so we can give credit to Dr. Ben O'Nig for being one of the first people to like talk about this was the idea of the, uh, the preferred motion path for or the movement paradigm was previous, they thought that, you know, podiatrists and some of the footwear people thought that by doing these posts that you were going to stop this motion. And then as they started doing more, you know, looking at the literature and and doing this as research, they realized that even if you put somebody in a shoe like the Brooks Beast, 
which is supposedly one of the most stable shoes. There's a massive post in there. It's super stiff. They throw everything at that foot to try to control that motion. And they found that people will still pronate and do their, the, what the foot's going to do frequently, right? So they realized maybe this isn't the way to do things. Maybe the goal is to stop motion. They also found that some people actually didn't, you know, clinically what we see is that even though somebody might have a highly pronated foot and might move a lot, they may not do well in, in arch support or post, and they actually end up causing them more injuries. And we talked about that sometimes pronation can actually protect it against injuries. So why would you want to control this motion? What the footwear industry has been slowly changing is going, how can we maybe guide this motion? So the preferred motion concept from Ben O'Nig and his, and his group is that the foot's going to, the foot and the human body, because we can't talk about the foot in isolation, the knee, the hip, and all the other stuff is going to influence what happens. So it was the idea that the foot is going to move a certain way. The body's going to move a certain way, sometimes regardless of what you try to do to it. So the idea should be how can you help facilitate the body in, in supporting the way it moves, but maybe gently guiding it a little better for those that might need a little bit of help, right? So those of us, you know. <laughs> Just note, note the verbiage there. Yeah, may help might need a lot of I think I think that is a, a key point in all of the the production of footwear yep. right now is there's a reality that there are things that are still unknown but there's also good good theory and things right. being shown in the in the research we're just trying I think this industry and research is still trying to figure out how to do right. that best which is why right. like we laid out all those different shoes that's why there's yep. like 20 different ways to produce quote unquote stability Right. So now just just because we're talking about this and going, Hey, you know, pronation can be protective against injury. We don't throw out stability shoes. When people started hearing that a lot of people are like, Oh, you don't need stability. You just need a neutral shoe, you know, and you know, you may not for a lot for the majority of the population, you may not need a shoe, like a massive post. That's like supposed to be super. You may not need that. However, don't, Don't throw stability shoes out. There is still a subpopulation of people that do respond really, really well to having some stability. I am one of those people. My ankles are really strong. As these guys know, I seem to never get injured no matter what you you put me in, but I tend to like stability a little bit more, right? There are certain, there is some research that says those with a little bit more ankle pronation that a stability shoe can actually reduce the rate of injury in certain populations of them, right? So our challenge is finding the right group of people that do benefit from this, right? There are, like I said, there are certain people who pronate and they're fine and they do very well in a neutral shoe and you'll see them like curving over that inner side of the shoe and it's fine and they've never been injured. It's fine. Then you have the opposite. You have, yeah, exactly. Right. Shit. If you watch any of the like some of those Dragon elite runners, here. you have so much motion yet he's doing fine. He's setting he's running world record pace for 5k, 10k, 15k. Not so good at the half marathon, but I think he'll get better. I'm sure I think he still did better. good. I think he did good. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's not bad, right? Nine, but, but yeah. But so at least up yeah. six. Now, this also goes the opposite way. And clinically and working in running stores, I've also seen people with super stiff neutral feet who love posted shoes. And you think, I, I'm not going to put you in this shoe, right? And you're like, I love this. My feet like this. And that goes to another component of what Ben O'Neill talked about is the comfort paradigm. Is a lot of times when we look at what actually prevents injury on a large scale, one of the few things we found is if somebody puts on a shoe and it's comfortable and they like it, that may be one of the few things that does potentially reduce their injury risk, right? It's going, because that's one of the few ways we found of actually matching shoes to people because there's been a lot of research studies, like especially the military where they try to match shoes based on, on art shape and there was no correlation. It did not work at all. And we're talking like thousands of subjects, large, you know, what's frustrating about that. You know, what's what? really frustrating about that because I, I mean, that's what I, I, that's a big part of what I use clinically with people too, you know, cause that's his studies right. that come out have been helpful. Um, it's not, it's not sexy enough. It's, it's way too yeah. simple in some ways where right. like comfort, comfort can be one of your first drivers. I think, you know, I, I also think that there are some very unique clinical cases um, but I think what we're speaking with that, that, you know, that's where things like, Hey, do we need orthotics, that kind of stuff, right? There's some unique clinical cases where those are going to come into play, but we're kind of right now we're speaking more to the, to the mass runner, right? you know, like the non-injured runner, the, um, yeah, just more to the masses right. than this particular scenario. Right. So 
I think keeping that in mind. Right. Right. And so, even within the realm of stability too, if you truly do need a little bit more of stability or help, you also have to demonstrate where that instability is. So whether it's in the rear foot or in the midfoot or in the forefoot, because I mean, client specifically, or is that in the knee or is that in the hip? Forefoot. Right. So that's right. And so that's a whole shoes. That's a whole nother thing in itself, but you you'll see some that emphasize more in the forefoot or some that emphasize more in the midfoot or in the rear foot or, it's it's interesting to see how shoe companies play with these dual densities and their geometries to create stability in different regions of the shoe. So, so and I and I think that's a whole other topic that David you brought up that some you know we're talking about how how is stability built into a shoe and defining stability by shoes right. and that trends stability in running is different than stability in a shoe stability in running right. can come from the strength through your entire kinetic chain, your core hip knee, etc. We're talking about development of footwear to provide stability to the right. foot itself. There's it's so many things. Keep, that's what, yeah. This, this gets very, very complex and there's so yes. many different things that influence this, which is again, Matt, why it's, yeah. Two questions for you. One, yeah. what do we know about in terms of literature, in terms of shoes that are designed that can actually change the amount of pronation or movement. And then two, when you take a shoe like the Kayano light, um, explain how, how that, we, you talked about geometry providing right. stability, flesh out that concept a little bit. So we talk about that in our reviews a lot. We say the geometry, like we talked about the Symmetros in this way, like the geometry of the Symmetros right. creates a stable ride. Right. Flesh that out more yeah. than in us, us just saying yeah. that on a piece of That's paper. That's true. So most of the literature on actually changing motion, like I said, that prefer preferred motion path that Ben O'Neill talks about, is a lot of times we can't change that. And I, you know, those working in running stores, they may tell you, you know, I was one of those people at one time, like, yeah, I see this change, right? Unless you actually, like the, the human eye is not good at picking up those changes unless it is well-trained. So unless you have a medical, even some of the medical professionals, their eyes are not fast enough to pick up actual changes in motion. You need a whole biomechanic system and these are actually getting better. But a lot of times you'll actually notice when you go and test it and assess it, the motion's not changing. The person might tell you it feels different, but they're, the, these don't actually do as good of a job as we thought of changing motion. Does that mean they're bad? No, it doesn't. But it means that like, we these may not be doing, like the arch support, like posts may not be doing what they think they do. So this doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that stability may come from a different area. So don't get caught up in that too much. When Nathan brought up a good point of focusing me of, so if, if, the, if the industry is moving away from posts, what else do we have? And if you've read, any of our reviews on the website, you know, I talk about this frequently. So there's a lot of different factors. One of the things we talk about, like the Keanu light does this stuff really well. So when I talk about geometry, I'm talking about things like, do, is there a full ground contact outsole, right? The more surface area there is, the more stable things are. What does the sole flare look like? So this is something that Hoka does very well, right? Is the shoe is super wide. So the wider the shoe, the wider the base is, the, uh, the, the more stable it is. And there's actually a research article that just came out this year that actually demonstrated that these kind of maximalist shoes can be just as stable as something with a post, just based on the geometry, right? So they are the, some of the maximalist shoes are effective at doing that. There's other things where you can create, you know, the midsole and, and have, instead of a post on one side, you can have a little bit of a varus or a wedge in there that can influence a little bit of that motion. When I say that, it means the midsole is just a little, part of it is just tilted a little bit throughout the entire length of the shoe. They can- in So they, they put two foams together. One of yeah. them is slightly tilted. They might have yep. the same density though. Right. But it just, it's just that. where they interact. Right. It's the way they interact. Another good example, David is holding up a specific shoe, the um, Adi Zero, um, I don't know why I can't think right now. Addy Zero, Zero Pro. Pro. Thank you. The Addy Zero Pro, which actually did a very good job of that, where they have a firm midsole surrounding a soft midsole. So what ends up happening is the firm, your foot will go through the pass of least resistance, right? So your the foot's going to go through that soft midsole while the firmer sole on the on both the medial and lateral side that's going to help guide the foot a little bit without creating a post or something irritating to, to like push in the foot. It just helps guide you forward. Well, I don't know if that was intentional on their part, but it ended up being a super stable shoe. 
Now, the other way you can add the stability in is actually not that much different from one orthotic, which the uh, carbon plate, the whole purpose of a carbon fiber plate is to stiffen the sole. We know from the lit, so people are getting really excited about the plates. They don't actually improve your performance that much. People get really excited about that. What they do do is actually they can make the shoe more stable. All you're doing is stiffening up, which can stop a lot of that lateral motion and translation in different directions. So you're going to keep you more forward. That's what that does, right? So you can use plates in that same manner. So we'll be, we just put our review up of the Rocket X and this shoe does that really well. Where it's beautiful. It's a beautiful shoe, it, everybody. Despite having a soft sole, the way the plate is set up creates a very stable forefoot. Again, there is no, this is a quote unquote neutral shoe, meaning there's no traditional arch support and anything like that. But the way the, the rocker is another thing you can do to facilitate motion forward. The way the plate is set up in the forefoot creates a very stable ride and does it, it keeps you going forward rather than going a lot of lateral or medial translation. The small group that's also been lost is the, those that supinate or go out it's a very small population, but again, the, the goal, if, it's, if you want to keep people in midline, just having arch support on the medial side is going to cause some problems, which is where somebody like Brooks with their guide rail, they have it on the outside and the inside, because again, the goal is to create little walls that try to go like, if you've ever been bowling, right? The goal is to try to keep you down the middle as best you can, except the difference is it's not, you know, this one, these, that doesn't actually keep the ball in the court the entire time. And the, and Brooks, this is, I don't know if we should, we don't need to go down this rabbit hole, but Brooks talks about how their, their guide rails are actually for knee stability. So we that should, is, maybe, I, that's a whole nother topic that is very controversial. We, whether we won't go there can, right now. Yeah. Don't go but, there right but, now. The other, I think um, another shoe company that actually does the pronation supination combination really well. There's two actually. Yep. The, um, uh, the, I think that the Arahi and the Gaviota, they have that J yep. frame. I do yep. think that is helpful. Um, the second, the second one is actually Carhu. They have their fulcrum technology mm -hmm. and that has, that has kind of, if, if you look at it, the geometry of their dual density, yep. it's, it's full length from medial to lateral and it has kind of that dip in the middle and then Correct. also forward propulsion. So I think those are a couple that, that do that. Um, when we, Matt was talking about geometry I was talking about preferred movement path and comfort filter. And I think um, if you, one way to think about it is it, that's helpful is, is the shoe fighting your, what the foot wants to do, or is it letting the foot do what it wants to do? Because if it has a post and the, and the shoe and your, and your foot's going to move through that motion anyway, does the, does the shoe make that motion more difficult or does that shoe allow the foot to do what it wants to do? And, and if it's, it facilitates it in facilitates the right direction it. rather than forcing it. And that's, and, uh, go for it. I was just going to say, in one, in one way you might be able to know that is through how comfortable it is when you start bringing it right. through paces because right. the shoe is going to allow and guide the foot in that direction really subtle though. It's so subtle, which I think is why it's hard to quantify um, within research. It's but, very hard to measure this kind of stuff, especially when a lot of the, the reports are subjective because objectively it's, it's getting harder to measure going, okay, we've got the foot in the sole right now. There's things that we can't see what patients or our subjects are telling us. It's hard to objectify a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Um, but Nathan brings up, that's a great point. Cause again, the f some people pronate heavily because that's how they shock absorb. If you take in certain people, if you take that away, you took away their ability to shock absorb. So that may not be a good thing as opposed to other people to go, you know what? They don't have very good control over this motion. This is different. They might need that facilitation. So for those who are talking about recently going, yeah, we don't need stability shoes anymore. Like it's a thing of the past. That's not really true because you have to remember that people are very different and people need different things. There are plenty of people that do far better in a stability shoe than a more neutral kind of shoe. And that could and be vice a post. Versa. Yeah. It could it, be a post. A it, post is not evil just because it's what's been done for a long time. Right. Like it still might be the right thing right. for people. What we have now is that we just have more options on how things are done, which will reach a larger, larger group of people. Um, a lot of people love the, the way the guy rails are done in the adrenaline. There are a lot of adrenaline wear, wearers who hate this. And, but what's, what's great is it's going, you know what? Now we have, there are still posted shoes out there but there's a unique population that's going to do super well in a shoe like this. So now we have more options. Some people are going to be happy. Some people are going to be disappointed. 
that's that's just how it goes. How are we out on time? How are we doing? I think we're at about 20 minutes. Okay. That's awesome. Just so you guys I, th- just so you guys know, we could probably talk for like eight, ten hours and only scratch the surface on this stuff. So Nathan's doing a good job of keeping me on track. No, I think yeah. uh, the the goal of today was to to open up the idea that there's a lot of different ways mm-hmm. that companies are trying to do stability. The reason for that is that research is changing, but it's also not conclusive. So right. There's innovation, and that's why we talk about this is the art and the science to the stuff that we put on our feet. There's a lot of art that has to be done in the world of stability, and it was fun to talk with um, some of the companies that we partner with, um, just talking about their wrestlings of, hey, do we, do we keep going with posts? Do we go away from posts? Do we, you know, and, and they're processing that because um, there's still stuff to be determined. So you know, I think for, for us as clinicians, um, and for Matt as a researcher in particular, uh, for him, I think that it's, it's one of those where we, we're pretty soft in our recommendations and every person we, you know, it's, it's hard to go on a forum and be like, Hey, what shoes should I wear? Because it's so individualized and it, it can be fun though. You know, if you have five shoes in your rotation, you want to know which shoe you should race in. That's fun. But, um, it's really hyper individualized and stability is going to be that thing that we might see posts go away and then we might see posts come back because I don't think we know enough conclusively um, one way or another. So just, I always say use caution before forming some really strong opinions about things and be thankful that there's companies that are putting out different stuff for different people. And remember there, again, there are different ways to do stability and that's what all of us are trying to talk about on the website and reviews is going, you know what, there's other ways you can make a shoe stable outside of a post, but there are plenty of reasons why a post might still be good for a certain person. Mm -hmm. So again, Nathan brought up a good point is when you send us emails asking what shoe should I wear? And we don't know anything about you. Like, again, it's it's all about, it's all about the individual and some, you know, some people can handle anything they put on their feet. Like David, he can handle a stability shoe. He can handle a neutral shoe. He can handle anything, any shoe I send me. He's like, yeah, I'll put miles on. It's fine. (laughs) <laughs> Other people can't do that, right? So it's, it, again, some people don't yeah. even respond to it. So honestly, sometimes I kind of need it. The light yeah. of the options and some other things, like I, I flip-flop on my own. Right. So. so again, he, and David has pretty neutral, when we say neutral, right? He stays pretty far in the in midline, right? When he runs. And yet he still uses that as options, right? So he's running a high level of miles incredibly fast, but I think the concept I want you to get is this is an option, right? It's not like, oh, I only run in this one kind of shoe. And you might be surprised that you might benefit from one of these for a certain type of run. And what we want you to get in the summation of this is that these are tools. And each one of these has a purpose. And you might be surprised where if that a certain tool might work for you, even though you didn't think it was. And there might be some tools that don't work for you. Mm-hmm you're going to have to find that out. It's not as easy as saying nobody needs a stability shoe. Everyone should run in a neutral shoe. And it's not as easy as that posts are bad. And it's not as easy as stability needs to be done this way. We got a lot to learn. Yep. It's also, you know, on the other end, what we, what we came from were in the rebound of going, everybody needs stability. Everybody needs a post. You can't say that. You cannot say everybody X. It's pendulum swings. The pendulum swings. It'll swing again. David gets the last word and then I'm going to close this out. So I'm just going to say this. We are not going to talk about this further, but other methods of stability can also come from the fit in the upper as well. And in the influence of it on the shoe and not just that, but something as simple as traction. I'm going to give a huge shout out to the Newton Boko AT5 on the trail shoe because they've got these multi-directional lugs that look kind of funky, but I've never been more confident taking sharp trails like sharp turns on trails in my life and the the shoe just sticks and it has so much just traction and you feel so stable in such an unstable environment. So even something as simple as that, that isn't a stability shoe can still feel really stable. So that was a great, that was a great last word. We didn't even know about uppers. Um, (laughs) We definitely don't want to forget that. Well, thanks for listening to this. We are, 
uh, we love talking about this stuff, which is why it's hard to keep it to 20 minutes. Um, please, uh, if, you, if you like what we're doing and if you want to hear more, just subscribe to our YouTube and podcast that helps us do the stuff we're doing and check us out on Facebook and Instagram um, to follow the stuff that we're putting out on our website. Have a great night. Bye.